I'm, I'm going to start by apologising. Um, and anything I say uh, is down to Bjarne, my learned friend and colleague over there, who asked me to come and do tall buildings in Denmark. Is this the... So, um, we have a history, and this is one of the most important photo bombs ever. So there was Bjarne and myself just amusing herself, having a casual drink, and along come this long-haired Danish guy and stuck his head in between us. So I don't know who he is, anyhow. But this is... <laughs> we met each other. Um, Ashray Research, as you probably know, that uh, Bjarne is going to be El Presidente of Ashray. And so one of the things we do is generate from uh, tall buildings. Uh, uh, I was been twice chair of tall buildings is to generate this design guide. It was published in 2015. It's already out of date. That was two years ago. So we got to do a lot of work, which you'll see now. This is the buildings of where we are. There's a point. Of, oh. I'll work it out in a minute. So anyhow, um, if you look here, the definition is that there's this, uh, ashtray was, is, is always a bit slow to carry on with tall buildings. Their definition of tall buildings was uh, 300 feet, 100 meters or taller. And then there's this group called the CTBUH, the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And they came out with super tall at 300 meters and mega tall at 600 meters. And so when you look at this, you can turn around and say, ah, the mega tall, yeah, it's sort of there. At present day, there are 27 buildings either in construction or in design, which are more than 600 meters high. Now, then we come to Denmark. I mean, Denmark. <laughs> and, uh, I wanted to try and do this because I think it's always a, out of respect for the countries that I go and visit. We're going there. We should be knowledgeable of the country you're in. So here we are. So I think it's there. It's uh, 100, 102 meters or whatever it is. But what's even better is that there's a law in Denmark about building it. And the, the bottom bit is is, is, is the, the, the law passed six years ago that there won't be any skyscrapers, etc., etc., And then it says, skyscrapers aren't popular here. It may be chic to live in a high-rise penthouse in, penthouse in Manhattan, but it's not chic in Denmark. <laughs> Can't do anything about that. <laughs> but, um, so if we, go, if we go quickly back to this one and we start looking, so, so basically 100 metres, which is the tallest building, is about there when we do it. Okay. So it gives you some idea. So what we've been doing lots of work on, so this is the Burj. This is 867 um, meters high, when you can say, already out of date. This is a confidential one. This is 600 meters. So let me just try and give you a, a, a speed course on, on tall buildings so you know what to do with everything. This is not 600 meters of offices. What basically, these buildings are split into three parts. The first 200 meters is an office building. The second 200 meters is, is condominiums, apartments, call it what you will, the new jazz world. And the top 200 meters are hotels. And where we are this day and age, we're at five, six, and seven star hotels when they go there. Where the big discussion is, and you'll see some of my part, I promise to be very polite and not beat up Berkeley, but I'm going to beat the shit out of them in a minute when it comes up to some of their stuff they design, is the middle part when it comes up to condominiums are, and people have it there, is should it be naturally ventilated or not? So I'm in Denmark, and this is natural ventilation country. But we've got other things to, res to respect here. Fire and life safety, the pressure within the building, stack effect, which we're going to show on. And there's some, some basic studies that come there. So that's a, that's a typical 600-meter building. This building, I don't know where it is, but there's a part of a river in the middle which turns green on St. Patrick's Day. There's two other buildings on the left, the Willis Tower and the Hancock Tower. I've got no idea where this is. But as you can see in the photograph, actually blocks out the Trump Tower behind it. But just work, <laughs> work out the size of this building and just do think where it is. How about this one, the Kingdom Tower, under construction, one kilometer tall. OK? So the next time that when I do this very facetiously, and I am facetiously, I'll slow down well, be honest, because it'll tell me off in a minute, is Next time you're in a building like this, and if ever you get in a building and the fire engine goes past, just have a look and see if its ladder is a thousand meters long. <laughs> okay? If it isn't, you might be in trouble. The other part of it now, what's happened now, there's also a, a, a shift with the green beanies and the tree huggers and everything. 
Years and years ago, for years, when we'd done our energy calculations, you could live and dream. Lighting was in metric 12 watts a square meter. Equipment for plug loads computers was 20 watts a square meter. So what's now happened when you do your calculation? To get to net zero, we don't want to get around the, the, these, these numbers. So now there's a drastic reduction. With LED lighting, we're down to 4 watts a square meter for lighting. And now they've actually looked at what is the usage from equipment and not 20 watts a square meter, but it comes down to about 6 watts a square meter. So it's simple math. The idea is we want to get down, down, down to get to net zero, even with buildings like this. What then happens, you'll see in a minute, is the facade percentage to the building load increases. So now we've got to start looking back at the facade. Now you think of the 600 meter building, there's a hell of a lot of facade. So the facade now is becoming cr critical with where we're going. Here's just some of the other parts, whether we, other studies that we do, just simply looking at the facade on the building to have a look at what the watts per square meter are going to be, whether we have a, a triple glaze, an outside a climate window, or we have some sort of mesh on the exterior of the building. So here we have the, um, uh, I think there's their pointer there, I found it. So typically we, we, we have our base case, which is for us is the ASHRAE 90.1 base case with all the numbers on. So the percentage of the facade is 25%. Prior to about a year ago, we would give guidance to architects, those poor creatures who know nothing on earth, is that actually a high performance facade should be somewhere in the region of about 15 to 20 percent of the building load and no more. Get it down to 12 percent if you can. But now what happens on this side, as soon as these loads go down, the lighting goes down and the equipment load goes down, this goes up to 36 percent. So the facade now is a big fluctuating load of 36% of the total building load, and it becomes critical to look at it because we've got to deal back to the, as mechanical engineers to the architects and give them guidance over the, over the type of glass. ASHRAE 90.1 base case glass is 40% glass in the facade with a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.25. Five years ago, seven years ago, you couldn't even get glass at 0.25 solar heat gain coefficient, and now it's the maximum you can use. So you've got to think where we're going with this. Here we have other things. I've got a bit. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Denmark, DTU. I've got to think thermal comfort. So when you look at this, the other part is from the 40% glass that we have in our facade, which is what we, we, can, we have to comply with, just show me a building that has 40% glass. This is typical floor to uh, lowered ceiling glass. is about 65%, 70%, because that's what you want for daylight, for vision, for other things. So again, another handicap. How do you make 40% compliance with 60% glass? We all know about our daylight factors, again, with thermal comfort to show uh, uh, as a tribute to, to, to Fanger with a PPD PMV. Show it from day one. All this work is in schematic design, pre-schematic, pre-schematic design. Then we go here, occupant comfort. I've got to show this about the, across the floor. You all know it. We all know the golden rules again, back to architects. Above 10% PPD is bad. Lower than 10% PPD is good. If you see this, look where we are, 19, 20, 30%. Not good. Okay, so we've got to do something about it, and we can bring it into this. So again, diagrammatically, very simple, PPD, across the floor plate, not at a single place in there, and dynamic numbers. So the current um, comfort that we do are actually you know, 8,760 hours to show what's happening, and then we can sort it out from there. This is the major change we've had when we look at it here. Uh, the ambient climate conditions change with altitude. A typical rule of thumb is the... Temperature degradation will be 6 degrees Celsius per 1,000 vertical meters, right? So don't forget, we're talking at 600 meters plus. So what then happens is, and this is for Denmark, I was looking at the, the, the outside temperature isn't very warm here. So we start. So when we do our load calculations, and I always say this, if you're an engineer, you do not know your basic cooling load calculations or heat load calculations or know how to use a psychometric chart, there's the door. You should go out and become an architect because <laughs> you're going to be totally useless. So when we do the basis of heating load and cooling load, and lots of people look, and it's always very good, and there's always a few people that go, oh, shit, I got this wrong. Do you use now the temperature, which ASHRAE gives you, the design guide, for the whole height of the building? Or not? So we've started producing this. So we start off here at base, at zero degrees, because the ASHRAE, I think, is 10 feet, 3 meters. That's why it was that, it was something. And then we go all the way up. So as we go to 600 meters, we're somewhere in the region of about four degrees lower. So just think about it. What you can then do is for your heat gain calculations here, you can take then a smaller delta T across your envelope. We've had a great 
previous presentation about envelope and everything you know. So why not take advantage of that? That's the advantage. During the winter, the adverse effects, and it's getting colder. Now, the problem here, you don't really have it in, in Denmark. I thought Denmark was going to be a lot colder. When I lived in the Netherlands, it was minus 12. Here, it's minus 6. What happens is, if actually we was... Previously, I was in Delhi, which starts off at 6 degrees. It gets near free, below freezing as, as you go up a building, which I know a majority of engineers don't understand because what happens to the system? You've got, you're, you're confused. At ground level, it's fine. And then I go up 600 metres and I've got freezing in my pipes, which, which you come from Denmark. You know you don't want freezing in your pipes, do you? Because that's bad. So then the other one is wind speed. OK? Um, see all the turbines here? It's great. Very simple. So we know that wind speed increases as you go up the building. We also know that we've done physics at school, half row V squared for the dynamic pressure against the facade. So as you go up the facade, you've got a higher pressure on the facade. Now, other questions we should ask ourselves, back to our architects who specify the facade. It's a team game, isn't it? We all work together. So what is their infiltration rate? They write in their specifications and at what height? Most architects, when they see this, start shitting themselves because you get up to the top of the building, you've got twice as much external pressure, so all bets are off as what your infiltration rate is going to be. The only trouble is those poor creatures called architects only realise that after the building's been built. Right? And so, you know, it's easy. But just knock it down and start again. We made a mistake. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not going to happen. So then the other one is air pressure. And the other thing about this is air pressure, and this is a really great one when you think of physics, gentleman there was doing building physics, is when you start looking at the speed of a fan, when you look at air. You don't look at air being as cubic metres per second, but as kilograms per second, because the, 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 as we go up, the pressure of the air changes, also the, 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 the density of the air changes, so it's like doing work in Mexico City or something, the fans are going to start spinning because there's no weight of the air to go around. OK, so you're not going to get any air at the end of the ductwork. Stack effect. We all like sums, don't we? What are, who doesn't like a spreadsheet? Yeah? Really confusing. Architects love spreadsheets because they make us look busy. So this is just some of the stuff we've gone in there about the stack effect. The important thing about the stack effect is where the neutral pressure is going to be. So that's where the outside pressure and the inside pressure intersect. It isn't, as most people say, 50% of the building because it varies. Now, then, when you start opening windows, all bets are off because that, that neutral pressure can float up and down the building. So when the fire marshal comes along or the, or the, the captain and wants to know about where the fire's going to be, how the pressure going to be, um, is my exhaust fans going to work, am I going to get smoke out of the building, and you tell them that you've got a neutral pressure doing this, you're back to your 1,000 metre ladder on the outside because, again, he's not going to guarantee that you're going to get smoke evacuation. Um, I, I apologise for this. I don't know if you can see it, but here you can see this line that we actually take a, um, the variations. I've actually blocked it out here for simplicity, that it goes once every, I think, 10 floors or something. But what it is actually in a real building, so we do a load calculation for every floor because of the dynamics, which you can do. Spreadsheets are easy, but they just confuse them. I don't want to show you here 197 floors of things, as much as I would love to. So now the other part is we come down to, I was talking again about the, the green beanies and the tree huggers and where we're going to get with net zero. Who really understands what net zero is? OK? We can all talk about it, yeah. It doesn't matter how many PVs you're going to put on a building, it doesn't matter how many wind turbines. So you're going to get to net zero unless you start looking at the loads. So here we've started looking and publishing because a lot of um, uh, an incorrect philosophy is, oh, these tall buildings and the mega tall buildings, they consume a lot of energy. But of course, they're big buildings. You've got to see how much is in there. So when we start looking, this is in K EUI, KWH, at, at site. And I understand there is a big difference from what we use in America and the rest of the world as opposed to Europe. So this includes exterior lighting, all elevators, escalators, car park lighting, everything, which is much different than what I believe the European norm is for, for EUI. Look at these EUIs, 62, 67, which, which are pretty low. We've got to get lower than that because this is net zero. Do I have enough renewables to figure out to this? Well, you can put enough turbines on there, but it means you're going to start coming back to cogeneration, so you're running off natural gas and burning lean-powered natural gas and doing heat recovery, etc. You know the story. We've, we've had two presentations which are pretty good on that. And this is the story, CO2 emissions. Who's worried about energy, what energy cost is? You are worried about it, but this is the big boy that does it, isn't it? Isn't this the game, the 2030 game, emissions? 
This is a great one. I've got to do it. I'm nearly finished now. I think I've got enough time. Two minutes. Adaptive comfort. This is the world wonder. This is absolutely brilliant. You've got to laugh. You've got to think. I've got to finish on a good note here. Adaptive comfort. Comes from the guys in Berkeley. Uh, there's one, one person we had here. I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm an old fart. I wouldn't have come down. Mean monthly outdoor temperature. What the hell is that? What is it? Mean monthly outdoor temperature. It's what is someone massaging a bad result with statistics to make it look good. So you're in the court of law, and they says, why isn't your building warm? Well, I use the mean monthly outdoor temperature. Yeah, there's a the door. Off you go. Pay the money. So now we've got it. So don't forget, this is a great one. This is for Delhi. So we start at the top of the... We start at 43 degrees, and we go all the way down. Bearing in mind, this is what people ask for and look for. You can say, yeah, OK, what's happening? Just happens for this exercise in Delhi, we were looking around. One of the great things, climate consult, we know all the pretty dots. So with each dot is, is a... Is a Temperature, humidity condition at each hour of the year. So we've got 8,760 dots, and it tells you how many hours you can use in the actual ventilation. Now we go to the next thing. When I, when I was learning, trying to use math and spreadsheets, I was under the impression that all the dots had to be within the two lines, which is 90% acceptability. The two outside are 80%, okay? It doesn't tell you on what day of the, of the year or the week. So you control all your 8,060 hours and find a good, ah, that's a good one. So let's put it in the middle there, yeah? So this is mean monthly. Never fear. The Berkeleyites come up with something even better. So they got this, which I'm sure any of you can get a PhD dissertation with, of doing, ever heard of this? The exponentially weighted running mean temperature. Ever tried explaining that to an architect? <laughs> what I've got? So it says you pick a day. And I go five days before that, add it all up, and I go five days after that, and I get a temperature. It doesn't say what day you start, so again, you can look at everything, and you get a daily mean temperature and a running mean temperature. And again, the dots are supposed to be in the middle of the graph. <laughs> How ridiculous we've got this, and no one has actually run the numbers to find out whether it can be usable or not, right? So <laughs> this is good, so you get to show this to the client. Well, this is what it's going to be like. OK, tough shit. Call the lawyers. This is the best one. I call this the dreaded chart. Right? You'd be fun. I can, I can, one American, two Americans here. We know great fun. So this is in here, ASHRAE 55. Nobody knows why that line is in there, but it's set in there at 0.12. It says very clearly, if you're above 0.12 moisture content, you can't do it. You can't use anything. Don't know why. Right? But it's there, the dreaded chart. Pick it up. It's used a thousand times. What they do is they get a dart and they throw it at it, and where it lands, and they send that in, and Lee says, you passed, Three, off we go. So now what I do is, if I take that same weather data I've got, and I put another line in at 0.12, because I've come through the dreaded chart, because 0.12 is 0.12, yeah? Look at all the hours that are outside of that. Holy shit, we can't do it. The good thing about it is that if the, you get high velocity in the space through the natural ventilation, we can get a lot of air movement, because of the moisture, the paper sticks together and stops it blowing off the table. So problem solved. Here again, adaptive comfort. I go from a hypothesis that the human being has the same sensations, whether it's in a conditioned space or an, an actually ventilated space. If you feel draft, you feel draft. It doesn't matter where it comes in. If you feel cold, you feel cold. So why is it when I express natural ventilation space as PPD, if you can see these 60, 63, 64%, you are not going to tell me, and I will argue, just for the fun of it, that you're going to be comfortable naturally in ventilating space when the PPD is at 60%. Not going to happen. Here's the other thing when we were talking about our pressure ventilation. I'm not going to explain this. Another great spreadsheet. But this shows you what the pressure relationship is going to be on a horizontal plane in a space. So you've got dryers, you've got uh, kitchen hoods, you've got uh, uh, vent, uh, elevators going up and down, people opening doors. You've got all these dynamics. So imagine doing this then for two, well, not 200 floors, but 60, 70 floors for the condominium part. The other part about it is, so we go with the green bean is, we open the windows. What about pollution? The buzzword these days, PM 2.5, PM 10. I don't have to preach to you guys, do I, about this. Where does it come from? Why don't we start showing it? There's this great website that you can go through. I've got one on my thing, Air Matters. Why can't we start doing this? So are we certain? that when we want to go natural ventilation, that we are not asphyxiating the people that are in the space. That was it. Thank you very much.